Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio with a Workbench Wednesday vlog. I hope you are having a great day wherever you are and whenever you happen to be watching this. Recently I've been working here on the Goldfield and Calico, my new ON30 project, which is adjacent to the Thunder Mesa Mining Company layout, actually right across the aisle here. And uh, today I want to install the NCE power cab. This is the DCC system that I'm going to be using to run the layout. This is actually the old one from the Thunder Mesa layout. I'll be getting a new system for the Thunder Mesa layout, but this one still works great. So I'm going to be using it on the Goldfield and Calico, and I thought I would just walk you through the steps it takes to uh, install one of these systems. It's pretty easy. The great thing about the NCE power cab, in my opinion, is that it's an all-in-one system. A lot of these systems, you'll have a separate throttle and then a box that it plugs into. With the NCE power cab, it's all in this one handheld unit. It's very compact and easy to use. You can program locomotives with this. You can do just about everything with this thing, as long as it's a fairly you know small to medium-sized layout. Larger layouts, you might want a booster, something like that, but that's not really something we need to get into today. Uh, to install this, we need three things. We need the power cab itself, right here in my hand, and we need a power supply. This uh, comes with it. This is the little wall wart, which um, transforms the 120 power of your house or studio or garage or wherever into something that the power cab can use. And then you've got this little face plate that everything plugs into. And I think we're going to install this first. That's a good place to start. I think I want to mount this right about here on the layout fascia right next to this toggle switch, which controls the uh, lights for the Calico Mountain section. It'll be nice and centrally located for the entire layout. Um, before I start mounting it on there, I'll show you the back side of this, the business end. Uh, this is where the power plugs in right here. This is the uh, the out for the track. So your track uh, feeders would plug into that. And this is so this is so you can daisy chain these together. So you could have another uh, face plate around the corner where you could unplug and then plug your uh, your uh, another cab into that to control your trains with. If you had a bigger layout, uh, there's two plugs on the front of this. The right one is for the power cab. The left one would be for a secondary throttle if you happen to have one of those. But we're all going to be concerned with uh, this one today. So I'm going to want to cut a hole in the fascia right here so all of this can nest back in there. Um, measure up here about four and a half inches. Just mark this off. You know, while this is technically part of the Goldfield and Calico project, um, it's pretty general too. So I thought that would be better as a workbench Wednesday. So that faceplate is uh, three by two inches. For the unit itself, come down about three eighths of an inch from the top. I'm going to say about a quarter inch from each side. Okay, so that is the area I need to remove. This fascia is some uh, eighth of an inch thick masonite, so it's pretty easy to uh, to cut through. I'm going to start by drilling holes in all four corners with a quarter inch bit here. I'll cut the rest of it out with a keyhole saw. You know, I could use a power saw to do the rest of this, but I worry about the vibrations of it. This is a little, just a little bit gentler. Takes a little longer though. Clean it up a little bit with a sharp blade and my utility knife. What's that old carpenter's maxim? Measure twice, cut once. Well, 
I measured once. <laughs> so this is a little off. That's okay. I'll make it work. Just need to enlarge the hole a little bit. Stand by. Okay. That will work. That'll do just nicely. What do I do with my pencil? Just need to mark or to drill some holes for the screws. We're going to hold this on. I've got four little sheet metal screws to attach this with. Not sure if these came with it or I got these later. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> these will do a fine job of holding it to the face shader. Using a 1 16th of an inch bit allow these screws to self-tap here into the uh, masonite. The red LED goes at the top. I, I don't suppose it really matters, but that's the way I had it before. So. Before we get too much further, I want to modify this plug here that uh, brings uh, power from the wall wart. One thing about these power cabs is they, uh, they don't have an on off switch. When they're plugged in, they're on. When they're unplugged, they're off. And I would like to add an on off switch. And I have another one of these nice looking paddle toggle switches. I thought I'd put it right here on this side. This is a, a single pole, single throw switch, so that's all it is. It's off or it's on. So the first thing I want to do is drill a hole to mount the switch in. And I've measured. I want it to be equi equidistant, <laughs> like this one is from that side. So it'll all line up nicely and look nice. I drill a little pilot hole first. So when I bring the larger bit over, it won't wander. Bad. So I need to split this wire. There's a couple ways to do this. One would be to just cut the whole plug off, you know, strip insulation off of both sides and then, you know, attach the plug to the, uh, the switch. But I'm doing this the lazy way. <laughs> Just to kind of remove, just going to split the wire and remove insulation from one side. Make sure I didn't remove any of the insulation on this wire. Oh, that looks good. Strip some insulation over this wire. Everybody asks about these wire strippers. Uh, these are by No Easy. It's an FS-D3 and works pretty well. It automatically adjusts. At least that's the theory. It doesn't always automatically adjust, but they work pretty well. Pretty nifty tool. Easier than having to, you know, have one of those that you have to search for the right size, you know, the right gauge. Loosen these up. Fortunately, the power input is like right there, so this is really close to it. That's why I put it so close up to the to this jack. Just a little hint. It took me years to figure out. I'm sure this will not come as a surprise to a lot of you when uh, wrapping wires around a screw like this and you're going to tighten that screw down to hold those wires in place. Wrap it in the same direction that the screw turns. So righty tighty. Alright. 
Uh, let's see if this works. Take this off. So I'm going to need to take it off anyway to wire the uh, track in there. Right, that out. All right. Now this jack plugs into here. And if I did this correctly, when I plug this in and flip this switch, that red LED should illuminate. Let's see how we did. What the heck? Oh, <laughs> I forgot. This has to be plugged in. Let's turn that off. Ta-da! Okay, that's working. Awesome. One nice thing is that there's already a DCC wiring bus running underneath the uh, Calico Mountain section of the layout, so I don't need to uh, solder any feeder wires or anything like that today. Just need to hook this up. And yeah, I'm doing this all before the rest of the track is finished. You can do this at any time on a project like this. Only got about half or less than half of the track work done uh, for the Goldfield and Calico, but uh, that way when the rest of the track is in, everything will work. I hope. The nice thing is this little input jack here for the track is actually a little plug that you can remove. Just makes things a little bit easier. I mentioned the DCC wiring bus, and what that is, is it's a pair of parallel wires that runs underneath the track everywhere that uh, the track is on the layout. And that way you can drop feeder wires down like this for every section of track. I like to do it about every three feet or more if there are more sections of track there. You don't want to depend on the rail joiners you know, to uh, keep that that current going between the different sections of track. This comes up through here. And plugs into here. And we can reinstall this, I think. Let's probably check the uh, check, make sure we've got power to the track first. Plug the power cab in once again. Flip the power switch on. Give it a second to initialize. There we go. I've got uh, my 440 on the track up here. Let me bring this up so you can see. There we go. This is a Bachman 440 uh, for the Goldfield Calico, number 12. Nice oil burner. And I uh, have no idea how dirty this track is. I guess we'll find out. We'll try the headlight first. Yeah, good. This one doesn't have sound installed yet. Without all the track down, all I can do right now is just run it back and forth, but that's enough to let me know that it works. Now I can reinstall this face plate with the four screws. Actually, first, I'll get rid of this pencil mark. Okay. Well, that worked out just fine. I think I want to show you one more thing, though. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that these DCC controllers can do. But one of the most basic functions is changing the locomotive address. DCC locomotives generally come from the factory with a default address of 3. And you're probably going to want to change that. 
because, well, if you're running more than one locomotive, you're going to want to change it because <laughs> otherwise they're all going to be number three. And when you put three in, they're all going to go. So you, I want to change this. I want to program the locomotive's number into here, which is number 12. That's always the easiest way for me to remember it. Just use the number that's painted on the side. And I'll show you, uh, there's a couple of different ways to do that. Now, taking a quick look at the LCD display here on the power cab, we can see that uh, locomotive number three is the one that's currently selected. That's that one sitting on the track right there. And we want to change that address to 22. So come down here to program escape button. And that's going to uh, access all of the programming features on the power cab. And the first one that comes up is program on main. Back in the early days of DCC, um, you pretty much had to use a programming track to program a locomotive like this. And a programming track would be a section of track that was connected to your controller, but not connected to the rest of the layout, isolated from the rest of the layout. These days, most modern controllers allow you to program on the main, and this NCE cab does that. But in my experience, it's still usually better to use a programming track. What programming on the main means is that um, there could be other locomotives, other things with decoders sitting on that same circuit, that same main line, and the decoder will, or the uh, cab will find the one that you want to program and only change, you know, the settings on that one locomotive. In practice, <laughs> it doesn't always work that way. Uh, you know, decoders come from a lot of different manufacturers. There are many nuances. So I find it better and simpler usually to use a programming track. And, and that's what I've done with the Thunder Mesa layout. And that's what I'm going to do over here. Right now, what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that the main line is a programming track. There are no other locomotives on it. The controller doesn't know the difference. So I'm going to press Pro program escape button. One, two three more times until I get to use program track. And when I get to that, I'm going to hit enter. And then it gives me a list of options here. We want to, um, we want to program the CVs. You can change the locomotive address without going into the CVs. The NCE quick start guide recommends actually that you only change the long address. It, there's, I don't want to get too many, too much into the weeds here with <laughs> and overcomplicate this, but you know there's a lot to DCC. Um, you can have a, a short address or a long address, and so um, <laughs> I like it to be, like I said, the number on the side of the locomotive. So we're going to go and do it in CV. So I'm going to press two to select CV, and it's going to ask me for. The CV number that I want to program. Uh, the CV for the locomotive ad address is almost always number one. So I'll press that and hit enter. And it's going to ask. So here it says three. Zero, zero, three. And we want to change it to zero, one, two, or just 12. So we're going to go zero, one, two. Enter. And that's it. Now it's going to ask you if you want to program another CV. We don't, so we're going to hit Escape. And it's going to take us back to the, the Run menu. Um, and still, you see, number three is still selected. The next thing I like to do, just to make sure that this takes, because it, sometimes it doesn't, is turn the system off. Wait for, uh, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, and then we'll turn it back on again. And I'll flick this back on. Go through all of its initialization. There we go. Still has number three selected. Now we want to change that. We're going to select 12. So select. One, two, enter. And we'll see if it worked. First, we'll try the headlight. Yeah, that's usually a good indicator. And we'll give it a little throttle. Don't want to run off 
the end of the track. Put it in reverse. Okay, that is now locomotive number 12, at least as far as the controller is concerned. I wanted to show you the, the CV method for changing the address because, like I said, it changes the route. If you put in a long address, what it's basically doing is overlaying that address on the default, which is still going to be number three. And it's not as reliable, in my experience, as just going in and changing that root address, the main address, uh, to what you want it to be. Uh, and I wanted to show you how to do it uh, using the CV function because if you're going to be uh, working with DCC, that's something you're going to want to know how to do. You're going to want to know how to uh, uh, to uh, program those CVs, especially if you, if you have a sound-equipped uh, decoder in your locomotive. This one is incredibly basic. It's just, you know, forward, reverse, the speed steps, light on, light off, and that's about it. Uh, there are much more sophisticated ones that have all kinds of uh, sound effects, you know, bells and whistles, <laughs> all the bells and whistles. And uh, knowing how to program the CVs is really going to help you out uh, to get m the most out of your uh, DCC system. Uh, you can usually get a list of what all of the CV values are for your particular decoder from the manufacturer of that decoder or the locomotive. Well, there are many, many more things that I could say about a DCC system like this, obviously, but um, those are the, the bare minimum things you'd need to know to get a system like this installed, change the locomotive address, and get some trains running. Uh, I don't get anything from NCE for talking about their products. I just really happen to like them. I've used them for years and found them to be robust and reliable, so I highly recommend them. But that's going to bring us to the end of today's Workbench Wednesday vlog. I want to thank you all so much for watching today. Remember, you can also follow us over on Instagram at thunder.mesa and find the links and resources and merchandise available on the Thunder Mesa Studio website at thundermesa.studio. As always, a huge shout out and thank you to our Patreon members and YouTube members who helped to make these videos possible. Couldn't do it without you guys. Until next time, keep moving forward, my friends. Adios for now.